Commonwealth Club, a tour program that's been co-sponsored uh, by the Commonwealth Club itself, along with the New America Foundation, and uh, we are delighted that uh, you are all here with us today, and uh, we promise to have an exciting and stimulating and educational program for you. Uh, my name is Noel Perry, and I founded Next 10 about eight years ago, right after we had the, the dot-com crash, along with uh, the state for the first time going $15 billion into debt, uh, and also what you probably remember to be the electricity crisis. So uh, I have five sons, and right around that time I was a uh, venture capitalist uh, working uh, in many different areas, but particularly with companies like uh, LeapFrog Toys and also First Best Organic Baby Food and some other kinds of companies. But anyway, I was inspired to start Next 10, which is the next 10 years in California, because I was concerned about the future of the state. And with five sons, I care about what happens here. I was born and raised in Rhode Island, but I've come to uh, totally love California and, and what it offers us. And I still, even though the Californians, some people believe that uh, uh, we're somewhat tarnished because of what's been going on with the budget, I believe deeply in the future of the state and the fact that we are the growth of innovation and, and we are the leaders of the future in, in many different areas. Um, so uh, here we are today um, and we're going to do the California Budget Challenge. The California Budget Challenge is a nonpartisan tool that over 300,000 Californians have, have used. And uh, for example, over the last year, we've uh, made presentations to over 100 groups similar to use using the clicker technology that you're going to use today. So we're really excited to be able to play a small role in, in helping to educate uh, Californians. Um, today marks the uh, update of the May revise for the California Budget Challenge. Um, as you know, the way the budget works uh, in January, the, the governor comes out with the budget. That gets revised in uh, May. And so after it's revised, based on new revenue projections and other kinds of factors, um, uh, it's a different situation. So we have to update our challenge. And so we took this opportunity with the update of the challenge to invite all of you here today and these wonderful three experts who have taken time out of their busy schedule to be with us today. I want to say that um, this, uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Tim Gage, he used to be the Director of Finance. He works with us to, he's our expert to help revise his questions. We've also had Mike Genest, who uh, used to work for former Governor Schwarzenegger as his Director of Finance. Uh, so we are advised by good people on this, and our goal is always to make sure that it's a nonpartisan approach. But today, uh, we've just, this is hot off the press, we've just recently revised this. You are the first group to uh, have this experience. And so, just so you know, we, we want to improve uh, the challenge. And so, you may have actually suggestions for, for changes that can make this better. And so, we're totally uh, open to that today. Um, one other thing regarding um, California. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, over the last eight years, we've been struggling with the budget. It has taken a toll on the state. And one of my firmest and de deepest beliefs is that uh, over the next few months, California can get the budget challenge resolved so that we can move beyond this and start to, to, to work, on, uh, work on improving K-12 education, higher ed, our prisons, you know, our safety net. Um, it really has been an opportunity for us to focus in year after year on the budget where we haven't been able to, the legislature, uh, the focus has not been able to deal with these other issues. So I, I, I'm hoping myself, and probably I'm joined by many of you, that we do uh, get this resolved. Um, so a few housekeeping things. If you could turn off your cell phones, uh, that'd be great. The bathrooms are in the back there. Lunch is going to be served at noon. Uh, we have a great lunch. What do we have? <laughs> Sandwiches. Okay. <laughs> and uh, also, um, We've entered, all of you, you know, the budget can be kind of um, stale sometimes, but we have a raffle that we've, we've uh, put all of you into. Uh, and so at noon, right, when we finish, we're going to know who the winner is of the raffle. And the raffle is uh, a, a, what is it, Sarah, to go to the restaurant right up here? Which restaurant? The, the fabulous water bar restaurant, right, um, and the Bay Ridge. Uh, and I'd love to give some to that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great restaurant. I've done this. 
stick around. <laughs> I must not be. <laughs> um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce our our panelists. Uh, we are truly honored to have all of them here. We have John Myers. Uh, I was John sent me an email this morning, and uh, I, I thought he, maybe he couldn't because of something happening in Sacramento. But he said that he couldn't stay afternoon. He has to be with his editors. And I said, oh, thank God he can be here. But anyway, I'm Q KQED. Actually, in 2003, when we got started with Next 10, he spent more than 15 years as a reporter, anchor, and editor of both TV and radio news, in addition to his duties as Sacramento Bureau Chief at KQED. And the California Report, John's reporting work uh, has been featured on a wide variety of national news outlets, including National Public Radio, <coughs> MSNBC, News Hour with Jim Lair, and beyond. In 2004, John began a daily news blog, Capital Notes, uh, which today is the longest running news blog of its kind reporting on California politics. And it really is a fabulous blog. And you know, Next Tense in the, in the business of educating Californians, I think John's been doing that for, for many years too. Uh, then we have Dan Schneer, who we're honored to have. For years, Dan has been leading political and media strategist in California, whose record includes work on four presidential and three gubernatorial campaigns, in addition to his position at USC, where he works to motivate students to become active in the world of politics and encourages political officials to participate in the daily life of USC. Uh, Dan is an adjunct uh, instructor at UC, at UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies. And finally, not last but least, the man of the hour, Jim Mayer. Uh, Jim is from California Forward, and California Forward is a bipartisan public interest effort to bolster democracy and improve the performance of government in California. Previously, Jim was the founding executive director of the New California Network, and before that, he was executive director of the Little Hoover Commission, an independent and bipartisan state panel that reviews state programs and policies for efficiency and effectiveness. So welcome, all three of you. Thank you for being here. Let's have some applause. For you. Before I turn it over to our panelists, I wanted to uh, have a little uh, brief instruction on the clickers. So everybody has a clicker, right? That's your voting instrument. Okay, so we're going to have a little, uh, we're going to do one question here as a warm-up. Uh, and the first question, uh, I'm going to invite the, the, the audience to, to answer this question that's going to be up on that screen up here. In the last 50 years, how many times has the California state budget been balanced? Number one, zero. Number two, 19. Number three, 39. Number four, 50. And so it, it is kind of a trick question. Um, question already. Ah, oh, you're smart, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so, so you have, uh, so, so if you vote for one, you push, push one. Very complicated. Vote for two, push two. And you can vote a million times, but it's only going to take the last one that's registered before we actually do it. So in other words, when we get into the challenge, if you want to answer the question right away, you can answer it, and then that'll be it. You don't have to do anything else. So Sonali uh, is here today. I'd also like to introduce Sarah uh, from Next 10, and Marsha was Marsha. Well, Marsha's here too. She's out there registration. So those are the three staff from Next 10 who uh, are putting this on for us today with me. So anyway, um, so let's vote. Okay, watch that. It's going to be, say, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, now I have to answer before it becomes zero. You need the Jeopardy music. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Wow, this is a smart group. Uh, <laughs> so the answer actually is 50. By law, it has to be balanced, so... I like answer number one, though. That's a good answer. <laughs> You're the real smart one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we got a good group here today. And uh, so, um, let me see. Without fur further ado, let me see, am I supposed to do anything else here? I don't think so. Without further ado, uh, we're going to start it out with John, um, who's going to start it at 35,000 feet and uh, give us an update on where we're at. The other thing, we asked the three panelists to see if they could come up with some questions for us to put up on the screen, and each of them has come up with a few questions. So, so
So they're going to have, each one is going to have eight minutes to do their questions and to explain uh, and educate us about the budget. So, John, please. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all of you coming out. That's, that's impressive. That is uh, far more people than I can get in my neighborhood sometimes to talk about the budget. Uh, they usually push me the other way when they see me coming out. Um, I, you know, I was going to say that you're getting sandwiches for lunch, and your real test is to figure out uh, how much of the sandwich you want to eat, how much of it you're willing to live without, how much you want to, how much you want to borrow from your neighbor. Uh, you see where I'm going. Uh, budget humor, man, that's really sad. Uh, so I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about where things stand up at the Capitol now. Um, we drove down this morning, and shockingly, yes, there's no budget deal. Surprise. Uh, we are... Uh, in a story that I did this morning for, for us for radio, uh, I said that really, you know, we are where we have been, I think, since January because we're stuck over that mighty T word is in taxes. Uh, and we've got, you know, the parties in pretty stark disagreement about that. We're actually now, we're, we, every year we seem to develop a new phrase, a new way of looking at it. So now we're talking about bridges. And this is the governor's uh, phraseology now. So uh, yeah, he wants a bridge, a tax bridge. Now, because you may remember he wanted a special election on taxes when he took office in January. He actually won that election on June 7th, so we're now two days past, and he would have voted, but shockingly you did, um, because he could not get agreement in the legislature to call that election, uh, primarily because Republicans did not want to call an election on taxes, and we can debate why that was later. Um, so now we have gone too far to have an election up or down on taxes before fiscal year starts on July 1st. So now the governor wants what he's calling a bridge tax decision, <clears throat> which would effectively be the legislature conditionally approving uh, 8 to $11 billion in taxes subject to later ratification by the voters. It gets more and more complicated as we go. Uh, the governor's staff has taken to even going on Twitter and putting up links to a YouTube video of Bridge Over Troubled Water. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, of course, you know where the other party says it's a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> Gotta love it. Um, but that's where we are now, and you've got uh, you've got the minority party of the Capitol still believing that this is not the right way to go. As a matter of fact, I think actually it's more complicated now because now they believe they would be pilloried for actually voting for the taxes themselves and not the election on taxes. So on and on we go. I think next week will be particularly interesting because June 15th has never meant anything in California. It has been in the Constitution for a while as the constitutional deadline for the legislature to send a budget to the governor. That's never mattered until this year. This year, thanks to all of you passing Prop 25, or maybe you didn't vote for it, uh, but the voters passing Prop 25, they do not get paid if they do not pass a budget by June 15th. There was some discussion as to whether there was wiggle room around that. The controller, the guy that writes the checks, effectively ended that, and he said, sorry, you're not getting paid. <laughs> and it's not retroactive, so they do not get the money back. Whether that produces any kind of squirming or wiggling, you had one Republican assembly member talking about uh, taking out money off his credit cards to pay his mortgage, which that sounds like he's not very good with money. So. <laughs> <laughs> but whether that produces any, I didn't know I was going to count the show. Whether that, that's the budget. Whether that produces any movement in the Capitol, we'll see. And that'll be, you know, what I and others will be watching all summer. So I, I came with a couple of random questions that I thought might present some of what I think is, is interesting about the budget, because as you will find, and you already know this, the California state budget, I think, is one of the most complicated processes I've ever covered as a reporter. And when I check in with people who cover state houses around the country, and even people who cover, cover Washington, we have one of the most complicated fiscal practices in the country, simply because we, the voters, have gone in so many times, and there's so many things that we have to sort out. So the first question I had is up here, which is, I'd like you to tell me what you think the size of the budget problem is um, for the fiscal year beginning July 1st. Is it $2 billion? $8 billion? Is it $10 billion? Or what's the problem? So use your Jeopardy clickers. Exactly. Oh, look, there's the clock on the corner there. And so let's see what you said it is. It's like a big reveal. $10 billion. 
seems to be the winner. With, I love the what's the problem. Again, you're the fun people in the audience. <laughs> um, well, it's not terribly a trick question, but it's, it's sort of a trick question. The, the, the $10 billion number might be technically right, but that's not the answer I would suggest. The answer I'd suggest is $8 billion. Why $8 billion? Because $8 billion is the size of the tax package that the governor needs on the ballot. And if he ain't getting the taxes, he ain't getting the budget. So the, the $10 billion has been the deficit problem. They've come up with an additional $2 billion of solutions. But the $8 billion is the immovable object. So you're right either way, but I would vote for $8 billion Because if you can't get the $8 billion, you can't get the deal right now. You can't balance the budget. So everybody's kind of right. Well, two and three are both right. Uh, what's that? Nine to ten have one of the right answers. Yeah, exactly right. You guys are on the move. So my second question to you was um, that the governor's plan to put tax extensions on the ballot, um, it wasn't really blocked for months for what we used to block budgets for, or budgets got stuck in. Um, you used to need a two-thirds to pass a budget. We don't need that anymore. Again, Prop 25. It wasn't even stuck because of approving taxes, which is a two-thirds vote. Uh, it was, in fact, stuck because we could not agree on putting something on the ballot. So my question is, um, California requires a two-thirds vote of each chamber to place a measure on the ballot. Um, are we unusual in that respect? One, no. Everybody does it. Two, 17 other states have this requirement. Three, only two states have this requirement. Four, nobody is as screwed up as us. <laughs> what do you think? How unusual are we when it comes to the legislature placing a measure on the ballot? How hard it is? I actually had to get help from the National Conference of State Legislatures on this one, so I didn't. Two states require 46, 17 states, 34 percent. You're, you're both still stuck in the two and three. The answer is two. 17 states require that. We're actually not the hardest state. Nine states require a three-fifths vote of the legislature to get uh, something on. I mean, a, 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 no. Yeah, not a three-fifths, thank you. I just did the math and realized that was the wrong answer. Uh, no, uh, they require um, um, a higher threshold than ours. I'm struggling with the numbers. We have some more coffee. We'll talk again. But um, we are not completely unusual. But 17 states in the country have a simple majority vote of the legislature to get something on the ballot, a constitutional amendment on the ballot, in which case we were one of those states we would have been, uh, we've been done with this by now. Um, number three was my question. This is one I love as a reporter. This is one I get all the time. We talk about education funding. People say, what happened to the lottery? <laughs> I voted for the lottery. I thought the lottery was going to take care of this. My question to you is, how much money does the California lottery provide schools? None. Two cents of every dollar spent. Twenty cents of every dollar spent. Sixty cents of every dollar spent. On schools, yes. On the K through 14 part of the budget, which is what the lottery is dedicated to provide its profits to. Survey says. You are a smart group of people. 59% pick the right answer. Two cents of every dollar. But it is amazing how many people do not know the answer to that question. It's only two cents of every dollar. It may seem like a lot of money, but we spend upwards of $50 billion now on public education. The lottery is not that successful. The lottery is actually more successful than it was a few years ago, but it will never get to that point um, to catch up to really do what I think the voters thought they were doing when they approved that. And my last one, if I have time, do I have time for my last one? Ah, yeah, sure, she's giving me the nod. Um, so the governor, as we know, wants a special election on taxes. We can talk about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. I would submit it was a political calculation. He didn't have to go to the voters. He could have just gotten the legislature to do it. Um, how many special elections have there been in the last, well, first of all, there have been five special elections in the last four years in California. How many governors have failed to convince voters to approve their pet special election proposal? None? Twelve? All but one. Well, twelve would be wrong because there were five yeah. special elections. All right. <laughs> now I'm giving you one and three. I just basically it. <laughs> how successful have governors been, in other words? Or how, you know, that's the gist of what we're talking about here. What's the governor's likelihood of success when he takes us to the ballot? <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> I need to come up with something harder. Only one governor has achieved this goal, Pete Wilson, in 
1993 with the sales tax dedicated to public safety. Uh, Ronald Reagan failed in 1973. Jerry Brown failed in 1979 with a proposal on busing. Arnold Schwarzenegger famously failed in 2005 with his measures. And in 2009, everybody failed with the legislature and the governor getting uh, taken to the cleaners on that one. Uh, and I think that shows how difficult the governor's path that he had put on forward here is going to be. Because once you get it through the legislature, the voters become very skeptical. And in the tax realm, I think they're even more skeptical. So I've given the hook. We'll talk some more in a moment. <laughs> Thank you, John. Speaking of someone who worked with Mr. Wilson and others. <laughs> You were there for that campaign, right? Uh, I was. And briefly, before I get started, what I will do is uh, add on to what John was saying about how difficult it is for a governor to pass a special election budget. I was Governor Wilson's communications director in 1993 when the half cent sales tax passed. Uh, three important things to know about that. Number one is a sales tax extension supported by both the Republican governor and the Democratic Assembly Speaker, Willie Brown, a bipartisan approach from the beginning. Second, that the money that would come from that sales tax increase was dedicated specifically to police and fire protection. So voters who might have been skeptical to going to the general fund had that answer. Third, the day of the special election, the largest forest fires in the history of Malibu <laughs> broke out. That fire made a big difference, I think. I have spent the last 18 years denying that I set those fires. <laughs> <laughs> but we digress. I thought you were coming clean for a moment. I feel better already. Um, I like, like John, I want to thank uh, uh, the folks at Next 10 and Commonwealth Club for putting this uh, program together. Uh, Noel promised you somewhat ambitiously an exciting, stimulating conversation on the state budget. And now that we've passed uh, through the comedic silence of John Myers, I should probably tell you that while I think it will be educational and informative and very helpful, exciting and stimulating is probably a little bit of a high bar for us to set for today's, uh, today's exercise. I've been in the Commonwealth Club before to talk about campaign finance reform. And what I've learned is that if you string those three words together enough times, you can take even the most highly caffeinated audience and put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here in the past to talk about redistricting, which is a much more efficient way of accomplishing the same goal. <laughs> and so I'm very happy to be here today to talk about the state budget. <laughs> it's going to be different today, Jim. Yeah. There's, there's an old adage. Politics. Actually, I guess all adages are old. That's why they're old. That's why they're adages. Um, there's an adage in politics. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And when it comes to passing a state budget, I think you can see pretty clearly exactly how apt that adage is. Um, when we poll at the USC College LA Times poll, and when the other uh, most recognized polls in California, the Public Policy Institute of California, and the Field Institute poll, not surprisingly, an overwhelming majority of Californians think we should have a balanced budget. Imagine that. Where you get into trouble is exactly how to do it. Um, we asked voters whether they would be wanted to see a budget passed solely through spending cuts, solely through tax increases, or through a combination of spending cuts and tax increases. A very, very small number said the budget should be balanced entirely by tax increases, less than 10%. Uh, somewhat larger. Uh, a minority, uh, roughly in the, the mid to high 30 percentiles, said that they believe the budget should be passed uh, by all spending cuts. And the majority said that they should, a budget should be, a budget deficit should be solved through a combination of tax increases and spending cuts. Now, from maybe not 35,000 feet, but 33,000 feet, that sounds like a fairly responsible electorate. But let's think a bit deeper. So we went to those people and said, all right, you think the budget should be uh, balanced, at least partially through spending cuts. And what we began to ask is what areas of state spending they would like to see cut. K-12 education? No. Higher ed? Not a chance. Healthcare? Transportation? Public safety? Environmental protection? No, 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 no. Uh, the exceptions, not surprisingly, are prisons, uh, welfare, and taking cellular phones away from state employees. <laughs> Check that one on the box. The governor, as politically adroit as he is, has obviously moved in that direction. <laughs> but obviously, that's a relatively small amount of savings. 
So then we moved on and we asked them about, okay, a lot of you believe, most of you believe, that the budget deficit ought to be solved at least partially through tax increases. Well, let's talk about what taxes you'd like to see raised. Sales taxes? No. Vehicle license fee? Uh -uh. Income tax? Uh -uh. Well, who will you raise taxes on? Well, tobacco, gamblers, oil companies, and wealthy people. So in other words, what we see after digging deeper into this question of the uh, Californians who want to balance the budget through a combination of spending cuts and tax increases, they want to balance the budget through tax increases on people other than themselves <laughs> and want to see spending cut on programs that do not affect them. <laughs> so as you go through, to me this is the real value, and I give Nolan and his team just such a huge amount of credit for putting together the budget challenge. Anyone in this room who, in the second hour of our program, is willing to impose additional taxes on themselves or support cuts for programs that you or loved one benefits from, you will have my undying respect. <laughs> and know that in the only the best possible way, you are abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> abnormal sort of a pejorative. Maybe we should go with special? No, that doesn't really work either. How about unique, commendable, noble, and hopelessly, hopelessly, hopelessly outnumbered? <laughs> um, what we can hopefully talk about a little bit later are the political considerations at play here. Governor Brown has, in fact, proposed a budget that is made up of some spending cuts and tax increases. And not surprisingly, uh, both parties have rejected the aspect of the budget plan least appetizing to them. They do it because of ideology. They do it because of the way the districts they, were the districts they run in were drawn. They do it because they know that the only way that a member of the California state legislature can lose a re-election campaign is to a more liberal Democrat or a more conservative Republican in a competitive primary. So the only way to lose a seat in the California legislature is to compromise. They do it because they have an actual set of incentives, ideological and political. California voters, they make these decisions because of a lack of tools available to them. And that's why I commend the next 10 budget challenge we're giving it was some Californians the tools to figure this out for yourselves. Best of luck. <laughs>
Okay, well, we did. We do it. So <laughs> last three years, would you say the California state budget is bigger than it was three years ago? Smaller than it was three years ago? Or has it stayed about the same? Bigger, smaller, stayed the same? General fund? Or open? General fund? Open. Open. General fund? General fund. General fund. I didn't think we were going to get this out. All right? This room says 33% bigger, 41% smaller, 26 the same. That is smarter than the overall electorate, not surprisingly, because in fact, over the last few years, California's budget has shrunk. Getting back to the point that motivates the California budget challenge, that most voters, even well-meaning voters who want to do the right things, don't have the tools at their disposal in order to do so. So, no thanks again. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Noel, for bringing everybody together and all your great work at Next 10. Um, now, I want to begin with, uh, with one of the answers in John's first question, which is, what's the problem, right? Because as you wage into this conversation or battle about budgets, what problem you're trying to solve will obviously have a lot to do with whether you're satisfied with the ultimate answer. And as, as, you, as revealed and explained and explored a little bit in the presentation so far, that if you're looking narrowly at the decision that lawmakers are trying to make in the Capitol right now, this is about reaching a, a, a budget that they can pass and that by law, whether by reality or not, is supposed to be balanced, right? And so in, within the realm of that, you get the choices that, that have been explored here. You know, you can either increase the revenues or decrease your expenditures or a combination of both. And so it's a game of mathematics. And within the capital, it's, it's not just a game of dollars, it's a game of control. And so um, overshadowing any conversation about how much to cut or how much to raise revenue is whether or not you need a simple majority to make those decisions or whether it's better to govern uh, by uh, consensus reflected by a supermajority. And you are all smart enough, as demonstrated by your answers, to know uh, how that breaks out in terms of blue and red. Um, but if you were to step back a little bit from the you know this one hand of, of seven card stud, and say, what are the rules of the game under which we're playing this poker game to see if we can't come up with, with better answers on a more systemic level? And that's something that we started a lot at California Forward when we first launched uh, a couple of years ago. We looked at the rules of that, of that budget game and we said, what's the problem with the budget process? How come we can't come up with better answers? And there's some very sophisticated analysis involving lots of um, experts and, and, and a variety of analysis, but I can, I can um, distill those down to three fundamental challenges that we've had in California increasingly over the last generation. This isn't new to this recession at all. The first is um, that we have a habit of spending money we don't have. And this isn't an argument for big government or small government. Once you get people in a room, you actually have to understand that you can't systematically, systemically, on a sustainable basis spend money you don't have. But in California, we continue to do that. The budget may have shrunk over the last three years, but there isn't one time in the last 10 years where the state of California spent, uh, did not, where it's, in every, excuse me, in each of the last 10 years, California has spent more than its revenue, right? So even in the good years, even when expenditures were growing by double digits, we were spending more than was coming in the door, right? So that's the first problem. The second problem is, is that government isn't immune to the business cycle, and it's particularly not immune in California where we have a very dynamic economy and a very progressive tax structure. We tax the rich more than we tax the middle class. Or, which means our volatile, we have, our revenue is not just volatile, it's the most volatile state general fund revenue system in the nation. Now, you can do things to the tax structure to make it more stable. Or you can do what most people who have volatile revenues do, which is to manage your money in your good times, save it, and invest, and have it for your bad times. And we have, and it's, 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 uh, it's hinted at by the discussion of the first problem, we haven't done that very well in California at all. So a second systemic solution we need is we need to capture money in good times and use it to, to, to fund essential programs in bad times. And the, and the third is that we, we are, there is any part of this discussion, none of these two big pie charts behind me say, here's where the money's going, here's what we're getting out of it, and here's our commitment to spend this money better next year than we spent it last year. Now, that, that's a very simple, a uh, principle of good fiscal management. It's one followed by many government agencies. This again, this isn't something that's unique to human, to households or unique to private sector. Uh, but our, our budget process does not include performance measures. It doesn't include or incorporate uh, analysis of whether programs are working or how we would divide that big slice of the pie that's going to K-12 to actually reduce all our rates. 
And so we, we worked on these and we've got some solutions to that and some of them have been in place and some of them are more moving through the legislature. But I want to now turn to, step back even a little bit farther from the rules of this poker game and say, what are the re what's really happening with these chips? What are we really doing with this? And, and, and at, the, at the end of it, when you look at the state's fiscal system, we again have three fundamental problems that we want to think about. The first is, is that the vast majority of Californians have lost trust that our elected leaders in the state are, are spending their money well. And this is not a D thing or an R thing. 50% of Democrats, according to the Democrats' own internal polling, don't trust state leaders with their money. Right? Overall, 65% of Californians don't trust them. Naturally, Republicans don't trust them as much as Democrats. But 72% of declined to state voters don't trust state leaders with their money. So this is a big issue. It, 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 you know, what do you do to fix that? But think about yourself just as, a, as, as active, involved citizens. If there's not enough confidence the government's going to spend our money well, that's a fundamental fiscal problem. The second biggest problem is that most of those poker chips, are they're playing with somebody else's money. And I don't, this isn't a Tea Party issue of they're spending uh, they're, you know, they're dealing with my money or your money. This is this pie chart right here. And look at the one here that says Health and Human Services, K-12 Education. Virtually all of that money is spent in communities. It's not spent by state agencies. It's not spent by Sacramento. It's spent by the city and county of Sacramento, the cities, the cities in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County to do K-12 education, K um, community college education, uh, to do the health, the, the safety net, how works, job training, those kinds of programs. But yet the trade-offs that are getting made, what's getting high-centered by this gridlock and all the rules, is really money that, that um, ultimately is spent at the local level. And once upon a time in California's history, more of those trade-offs were made at a local level. And finally, the third big problem is, is that we actually spend those monies, that money, with the desire of having an important outcome. And so the outcomes matter. And in fact, the outcomes not only matter in terms of are we improving um, the well-being of our communities, but it impacts future budgets. The reason why that prison budget has grown from $4 billion to $10 billion over the last um, decade is a combination of, of criminal justice policy and failures in the educational and health and human services system. We graduate our failures in government to more expensive, least effective solutions. Right? And so the long-term structural answer is, yes, we can't spend more money and we're going to have to do this kind of trade-off. We need to change these rules of the road so people actually have better and smarter choices to be making in the budget process. But we also need to rethink and restructure the relationship between the state and local government, especially around the fiscal system, so that we can re-empower community governments to have ownership of the programs that they're delivering, to be responsible to you as voters and taxpayers and citizens and clients and customers for the results of that system. And then, so that they can start having the conversation across governments that are necessary to deliver better results. Two quick examples. High school dropout rates, right? 30%, according to the Department of Education, of high schoolers don't graduate in a normal time frame from a normal school. They may come back and get something else later on. But in anything that we would call a high school dropout when I was in high school, you know, uh, three out of ten of us wouldn't have been there at our graduating class that were there as a freshman, right? That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem in a state like California that's trying to feed people over it. Now, what does it take to reduce high school dropouts? We actually know we've got very effective programs throughout the state. The schools alone can't do it. The schools can't do it without effective children's mental health programs, without effective drug and alcohol treatment programs, without ways to intervene in struggling families early when they know it, but effective programs that actually solve the problem. We know the solution. It involves more than schools. It involves cops, probation officers, private sector, nonprofit, faith-based community. We've got to get to a place where those solutions aren't one-off examples that we're giving awards to, but they are the industry standard for a government that can deliver the quality of services that impact their lives. That's the real budget challenge. Um, and that's where we're, I think the governor and lots of people are headed with the realignment. With that, we've got a couple of questions. And one joke or laugh out of that. <laughs> completely failed miserably on the standards. Of the I extinguished all the smart elements. <laughs> Good question. Uh, who do you trust most to decide how school funding should be spent? The governor and the legislature? The state superintendent of schools and the board of education? And only this audience probably even knows who that is. The superintendent of school the board of the local school district or the principal of your school? Where would you put the most trust? Maybe a shared responsibility ultimately, but where would you put the most confidence? Uh, two, one. Well, yeah. 
So when you saw that big slice of that pie that we're debating how to spend that percentage, um, actually, you, you guys understand the implications of that decision. Let's go to the next one. Who are the 2% of the government? Legislative staff is This is tough, so you don't get to vote up these things. The state budget for next year is about um, 10 billion out of balance, not the 8 billion solution that, that John accurately identified, but the balance is 10. Right. Uh, balancing the budget may require cuts in schools, health, social services, and prisons. How much would you be willing to pay in higher taxes to balance the budget? So this isn't going to get you his undying respect and support, but it may get you at least some of his respect and support. Because I'm not saying what you would cut, but I, what's your willingness to pay? This is a classic economic question. Put it on the table. Just, just general fund. How much are you willing to give those guys in Sacramento to, to close the $10 billion gap? So, you know, there's a good bell curve there, and some of you, you most of you are willing to give at least uh, a couple of good nights at a restaurant. Okay, let's go to the next question. All right, this is, uh, this is narrowing down a little bit, but it's, it's along the same lines. To balance the budget, some school districts are considering closing the schools a week early next spring. What's the most you'd be willing to pay in higher taxes to keep schools from closing early? Right. The last question was, give it to the state, let them balance the general fund, and it'll keep everything from being cut. Well, what about if we're just talking about the schools in San Francisco going all the way through June next year. How much more are you going to pay? <laughs> wow, I'm going to last. Let's go to the next one. Most, most of our children are out of school now, I guess. <laughs> High school dropout rate is estimated to be 30%. What's the most amount of money you would be willing to pay in higher taxes if you were confident the money would result in a 5% decline in the dropout rate? discuss this, so anybody who has ideas as we move along, you know, and maybe this is a product of where we are in San Francisco and your own relationship uh, with, with uh, SF Unified, um, but the trend that we've got from the dialogues and others we've been doing around is that the more you can focus people on results that confidence and, and that they can see where the money's spent, generally speaking, people are willing to invest more. Um, and, and certainly that's true in rather parts of, of the state. So something to ponder and think about, that these are the broader long-term questions around the state's fiscal challenges. Well, All right, let's thank Jim. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the uh, California Budget Challenge, which you've all come here for and you're so excited about. <laughs> let's get it going. And any of you who are really good at it, uh, the redistricting commission puts mats out tomorrow, you might want to think about running, because we could use you in Sacramento. Definitely. So just a basic review here, remember we started out the year with a $26.6 billion budget deficit, and then uh, the governor's January budget proposal, remember what he said he wanted to do, uh, which we've been talking about, our panelists have talked about, extending temporary tax increases, shifting responsibility from some services to counties, uh, cutting spending uh, to nearly every area of the budget, and we know that there was about $11 billion cut back in March. Um, and then we had the May revise, which is what we're here today to talk about. We had uh, 6.6 .6 billion in unexpected uh, revenue gains. Uh, and then so, um, you know, we, we've heard different numbers for what the, the budget deficit is. John spoke about 8 billion. So we're talking about 9.6 billion deficit uh, remaining after the March debit uh, budget cuts. Uh, and we look at it as 10.8 billion to achieve a 1.2 billion reserve uh, let's not worry about the uh, actual specifics here, but we are going to start out with about a 10.4 uh, budget, 10.2 budget deficit. Um, so again, the California budget challenge is not partisan, it's online. Uh, this was just updated uh, June 9th. Uh, starting point start, we're going to start with a $10.5 billion budget deficit. And remember that this California budget challenge goes for five years, so this is five years out. No, can I, can I make sure. one point that I think is that people don't understand, and the governor and the legislature have not done a good job of showing you this, maybe for their own reasons. In the slide a moment ago where it said there's $6.6 .6 in forecasted revenue gains, it's the unexpected windfall we've talked about. 
that number is not inaccurate, but it also is in a budget that includes the governor's tax extensions. If you roll the governor's tax extensions out of his budget, which is eight to ten billion dollars, we would not be ahead of where we were. We would be cutting more. Does that make sense? So when all these people that you talk about say, well, don't raise taxes, we have six point six billion extra. Well, that's assuming that the governor's eight to ten billion dollar tax extensions go on the books. You don't have those. You don't have a six point six windfall. You're actually under projection. So it's, it's some context that is missing the political debate. Anyway, sorry. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Before you uh, make your decisions. Okay, so go ahead, Justin Ali. Okay, first question, um, K to 12. So just so you know, so we're going to go through the challenge, and you're welcome to, to ask questions, any clarifying questions. Um, what I like to, I've invited our panelists to, you know, come up with any thoughts or anecdotal information that they have that clarifies this. Uh, I'm going to moderate this, and there's probably going to be a lot of questions. Uh, right now, I'm looking at a time check, and we got about five minutes of uh, 11, so we have good time. We have an hour uh, to do this, and so just please uh, uh, don't get upset if I cut you off. It's not because I don't want to speak. I just don't want you to speak, but we got to meet the time deadline. Plus, we're going to have time later to to speak, and we're going to do our raffle at the end here too. Okay, so how much um, should California spend per student K to 12 education? Okay, the first question, uh, the first answer will always be no change. So here we have no change, K-12 per pupil spending uh, in 2016 will be about $11,500, which is 13% below the projected national average re reflecting action on the budget in March. Um, number two, reduce the deficit to $4 billion and hold growth and total funding below the required Prop 98 growth rate. Uh, this would be 18%, leave us 18% below the projected national average. Number three, add two point billion to the deficit and use this funding to reduce the amount of school district funding deferred in the following year. This will increase per pupil spending by $40, uh, $13% below the projected national average. Um, and then number four, add four billion to the deficit and increase per pupil spending by $650, which will leave us 8% below the projected national average. So do we have any questions? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and the answer is no. That that would be too complicated for for what we're doing here. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, unlike the federal government, the state is required to balance its budget on an annual basis. So, depending on your ideology, you might see additional funding in preventive services and saving money down the line. On the other side of the aisle, you might see tax cuts is causing revenue growth in future years. But you can't figure that into your year budget. I'll just note that there is a national website now that explicitly has done the math and links dollars spent in education or, or at least uh, graduation rates and college education rates and how that affects crime, uh, public safety, and other kinds of um, and financial issues. And I think the other tremendously hard part about schools, and this is a broader discussion, and this is unfortunately makes this a tough choice here is that you can look at the per pupil number, but it doesn't quite get you to where the money is going. I mean, there's a great big discussion about how much control the legislature has over where they have to spend it versus loosening those restrictions. How much goes into the classroom? How much goes here? How much goes there? I mean, and you'll never get that resolved in one thing, but I think, you know, once you start to peel into education funding, you start asking lots of really complicated, tough questions about the, about the dollars. Sir? Um, quick question, numbers one. Have a difference of two and a half billion dollars in funding, but no difference in the percentage below the national average. So there's something funny in the numbers. Well, I can say that the third choice is the governor's main revision, and this reflects the governor's main revision, and the, the money is being used to pay back the deferral, whereas in the first choice, it's not. The first choice is the no change. So the third choice reflects the governor's main revision budget. So that's why you don't see Oh, that so the difference is there is extra money, but the money goes into the deferral. Pay deferral as opposed to the yeah. choice yeah, the, Jan the January budget said that some of the money we owe you schools, ah, we'll get to you later. And now May says, well, we got a little bit more money. We actually won't push off that, that funding issue, right? Okay, one more question, then we're going to move on. Please.
recession will continue another five years as a bill in anticipated revenue increases as the economy improves over time. Well, the, the, analyst, the, the, the what I have seen from the legislative analyst office, which is the really I wrap myself in a blanket that they're not part of they don't try to spend me. The economy is improving but slightly over the next five years. So uh, whether someone, and then we get into a debate about do the taxes impact the recovery or not. Um, I think the bottom line here is that you should assume the, the economy will recover slowly. You should not assume the economy will fill in the money that we have lost on the national. I mean, um, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, no one's even figured out the taxes that we've had in the last two years, what impact they've had on the economy. You're pulling apart these models of static and dynamic forecasting, and it's, it makes my head hurt. But I mean, the, the, the general consensus is. What is the revenue projections over the next five years for the state budget? Slight growth. Slight growth, but not enough to solve all of the cuts that have happened over the last five years. That's a general answer. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to go on. We're going to vote now. I saw a couple of questions. Sorry, I couldn't get to you. Um, but uh, why don't we vote on this? Tenali, we'll put this up. That's a topic. What would you like to do? I know everybody here cares about education. Okay, uh, we are going to add $4 billion to the deficit because you, we have, you have all 37% of you have decided to add to the deficit because you want to uh, bring some more resources to education. So uh, Sarah is uh, going to be running our deficit. So we've gone from a $10.5 billion deficit up to a $14.5 billion deficit. Okay, community colleges. What level of funding and fees should community colleges have? Number one, no change. Community college funding in 2016 will be about $6,000 per student and fees $36 per unit. Two, reduce the deficit by $400 million and increase fees from $36 to $62 per unit for a net reduction in funding of $100 million. Three, add $400 million to the deficit and use this funding to reduce the amount of community college district funding deferred into the following year. Leave fees at $36 per unit. And finally, number four, add 400 million to the deficit to increase funding to schools and return fees to $26 per unit. I will tell you that, the, again, from the Legislative Analyst Office, they still tell us, even with the fee increases in community colleges, we still have some of the lowest fees in the country for community college. That's not to say that we should raise them as a result, but the context is we're still below what a lot of the, co the states around the country are charging for community college. For me. that, that's an important point. Not a lot of people want to talk community colleges out there. Don't see any. Oh, there we go. There's a question. Go ahead. As a point of clarification, you have a legal requirement for a balanced budget. And we're talking about a deficit, running a deficit here. Those two things are contradictory terms. My understanding is that what you're talking about is borrowing basically the difference if you don't have a tax increase. Our particular problem is we are rated in the B's by Moody's at the moment. A minus. A minus? Yeah. Well, we're the low. Can we we're agree? still low. We're, we're, we're still really, really low. That's yeah. a, it's a weird, a rating, a minus weird minus. rating system. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're doing is a positive that we can continue to borrow to balance the budget when you answer these questions. And it seems to me that the, the, the likelihood of being able to continue to borrow is a major, major political and economic question. Greek, Greece can't. Right, I think your point is well taken. Keep in mind, people who are choosing to add to the deficit maybe have a solution on how to reduce the deficit as we move forward. Okay. In other words, we're, you know, we're, we're going to get, we, see, we're going to get into all those possibilities for tax increases, okay? okay? And, and also, just to something new in the in this uh, iteration of the California Budget Challenge, which we're trying out with all of you, is a cap. You know, that's being discussed in Sacramento, uh, and I know that Governor Brown and the Republicans are negotiating about a cap, but we have a cap here, and that cap is going to be the last question here, and it's going to be interesting to see how you all... I will say one of the most fascinating fundamental 
philosophical, ideological fight to the capital is do you decide what you want to spend and then find the money to, 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 to afford it, or do you take the money that you think is coming in and then decide how to divvy that up? Those are two different worldviews there, and I think it gets to kind of what you're talking about, about yes. do, you, do, do you look for more money if you want, you know, or do you say, hey, this is all I got? And we have that fight every year, year in, year out, about how you view that. Exactly. So, okay, go ahead. Okay, two comments. One is my own, and the other one is just me. My own is, whatever happened to the traditional method of budgeting, the correct method of budgeting, frankly, which is, what do we have to accomplish? What will it cost? How are we going to pay for it? Joe Smithians. Which goes to almost what I just said, yeah. I heard yours differently. Maybe, if, if Sorry. that's what you said, that's great. Yep. And, and then Joe Smithians' um, slogan, which you've been repeating for years, is uh, spend less, bring in more, do it now. Um, Democratic uh, legislator from Palo Alto, he's <coughs> a member of the legislature. Sorry. All right, thank you. And next uh, comment. So I, it, it, this is such a great effort. In the uh, planning field, in the urban planning field, the uh, AB 32 and SB 375, sustainable community, where look, there's methods like this where you can see the impact of your choices on outcomes. And this, to me, one of the problems with traditional budgeting is it's not linked to outcomes. So no one can see what the long term effects of these short term choices are. So community colleges, for example, are the big Thing that amps up people's incomes in the state, and we, we can't see any of those outcomes from the choices. Right, I think it's Jim. I think Jim, that's uh, your area, Jim. Yeah, it's clearly um, uh, the, the practice that we've been advocating for, and, and if you were interested, you could look at SB 15. And you could also take that element of that discussion and embed it in Senator Smithian's change because, <coughs> yes, it's what do we want to accomplish? How well are we getting there, and how do we use the resources we've got now? Do we need you can have the, both sides of these. Aren't, these aren't polar opposite no, no. points of view if you take it to a community level discussion. You can never see the balance. Exactly right. All right, so we are going to have a vote now on community colleges. Uh, Sonali, could you please put up the uh, five second timer? And uh, we'll see whether we're going to be increasing the deficit, reducing it, or keeping it the same. Yes. Okay, uh, you elected, 20, 45% of you elected to reduce the deficit uh, by 400 million. And keep in mind, remember when you're up in Sacramento, if you want to do taxes, you need to have two thirds of the legislature. So when we get into taxes, we're going to be able to, to have the opportunity, I'm not saying you're going to do it, to increase taxes with less than two thirds. Okay, next, redevelopment. Um, should California change the way in which it finances local economic development? Um, Number one, no change. Keep redevelopment funding as is. Number two, end the use of local property taxes for redevelopment, thereby providing local schools with more than one billion. Three, end the use of local property taxes for redevelopment, thereby providing local schools with more than one billion, and allow voters at the local level to approve school bonds with a 55% uh, local, to fund local economic development instead of the two thirds that's required. And four, modify redevelopment to reduce abuses, but retain the use of local property taxes to fund local economic development. I've had to become an expert in redevelopment this year, which is painful. Um, and I will tell you that what I find fascinating is that there, there are so many different variations of redevelopment across California. There are 400 local redevelopment agencies. They operate largely autonomously, without really any kind of oversight, they can they, they calculate their debt their, their debt load differently, they calculate their priorities differently. They do, however, have to spend money according to a couple of rules that aren't up here. They have to put some money toward affordable housing projects. And they do, in a lot of cases, share some money with schools now. The debate is, do they share enough? Does the affordable housing part work correctly? And are they overextending themselves? And as the governor has made the case, in this era where tax dollars are scarce, is this the best use of the tax dollars as we have? I will say what's fascinating is that the reason we have the system we do is that the voters put this in place in 1962 with a ballot measure to create what's called tax increment financing, which means that you take these property taxes and you dedicate them toward these local communities. And so now you've got these, I mean, the incentive for every community is to have a redevelopment agency because any growth in the property tax, they keep. It doesn't go 
to the formula that's everywhere else. So it's um, it's fun. And, and so, so that you know, so this question, no matter how you answer this question, it will not not affect the general fund budget because this is these are funds that are going to go to the local schools. Which is interesting because it's different than the governor's proposal then in that sense because the well, governor the governor's proposal would take them. No, well, it's the same. So the, this is every, all of our numbers are being pushed out five years. So in year one, it would affect the general fund by one point seven billion right. dollars. But in year five, we're just right. looking at the money budget. Yeah, the governor wants a one year right. fix to the That's general right. fund. Right. Then he would push it out to the local communities, which may or may not be legal, by the way. That's <laughs> Back to, to number three, and let's make sure everybody knows what you all decided to have 51% majority of us. Number three, end the use of local property taxes for redevelopment, thereby providing schools with more than $1 billion, and then you want to do the 55% change. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to the next question, which has to do, I think, with UC and CSU, uh, the economic engine in California, right? UC and CSU. What level of support should the state provide for UC and CSU? No change. Remember, the budget reduced funding for UC and CSU by $500 million each. That's what was done in March. Number two, uh, reduced deficit of $1, uh, $1 billion and cut funding to UC and CSU by an additional $500 million each. Three, reduce the deficit $1 billion and cut funding to UC and CSU by an additional $500 million each, but increase tuition by 32% to make up the losses of the universities. And finally, number four, Add one billion to the deficit and increase funding to UC and CSU by 500 million each to enable them to roll back, roll back the cuts made in March. Um, so um, UC and CSU, a tremendously wonderful uh, educational institution, which is uh, the light of the world. Really. <laughs> uh, so any comments? Go ahead. How much is tuition? Uh, how much, does anybody know what tuition is in UC today? Anybody know? We know it went, it's gone up 33%. We know that. 10,000 for UC. Yeah. Yeah. For UC? Yeah. How much for CSU? 6,000? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's gone up. Yeah, that's a great clarification. And just to complicate things even further beyond what we can cover today, the regents are now debating a proposal that would allow different UC campuses to charge different tuition levels. Once you go to Santa Cruz for a lot less money than, than Berkeley, right. sort of mixing and matching this approach. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. How does these compare to the rest of the states in the country? Okay, um, I know the answer to that. Does any, any of our panelists want to answer that? Um, you have five kids, you might know. <laughs> so my understanding um, is that uh, the UC system, in other words, if you compare the best U the best state universities in America, uh, California's um, fees are still relatively lower, just like John said about community colleges, than other schools, such as Michigan. And I, I'll stand corrected if somebody knows this, but I remember um, Steve Levy, uh, one of our leading state economists, would say that. Um, so one of the interesting things that has happened in these budget cycles, and, and, and Ethan and others from UC would certainly know it, is there has been a push to get more out-of-state students. Because out-of-state students pay a higher tuition. And if you're a region of the UC, you know, you solve part of your problem by jacking up the cost of those right. folks, which of course then presents problems for that guarantee about the top 10% of students in California get guaranteed a UC spot somewhere in the UC system. So, so. Again, we started down, uh, I wasn't here, but when we started the uh, UC system, um, I guess uh, it was free. Like way back when, right? When it started, so it felt relative to where you came from. Of course, there's that interesting thing where we continue to use the term fees, we're really calling it tuition. You know, we, we're so averse to saying that we charge tuition, even though, for God's sake, it's tuition. <laughs> All the way in the back. Uh, I want to say that the, the UC master plan states the goal of the school is to be free. And it should be by state law that nobody varies from that purpose. Okay, thank you for, for that. Um, 
Sarah, do you know how much it would cost the general fund to eliminate all fees along with uh, no tuition to make it absolutely free to attend the UC or CSU school? That's well, entire population. We'll put that in our background tomorrow, Dan. Okay. <laughs> you know, the old, saying about, the old saying about the state of California is that its three jobs are to educate, medicate, and incarcerate. <laughs> uh, we haven't gotten Medicaid yet. We haven't gotten to Health and Human Services. But, um, but there is a tremendous ongoing fight and people who, who want to show you statistics about how the funding levels change between corrections and higher education. Uh, and Governor Schwarzenegger actually tried to link the two. Uh, and, and everybody told he was silly to do it. But, but, but you know, there is an ongoing discussion about where our tax dollars over the years have gone and our priorities about where we're spending those dollars. Okay, so we're going to do one last question here. Go ahead. Sir, it says how many fewer students can get to go to school to reduce funding by a billion dollars? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. We can work on that. Do you know, Sarah? Well, the, it's in total, the, um, I think it's, it's close to a 20% reduction to the funds that are going to the school. So in terms of, you know, what's going to actually happen at the universities, especially if the universities are governed by the regions, there's really no way to say, um, but it is a significant cut to these and, and the CSUs have already gotten to the, to the place where, in some of these budget cuts, they have actually delayed admission for people who they were already planning to take because they couldn't do it. And I know that because I teach part-time at the CSU campus sometimes. And of course, quickly, the other thing to consider is when you implement those cuts in areas other than the size of the student body, what you end up doing is reducing faculty and class offerings. So my students at Cal, whether they want to or not, end up staying five years or longer simply because the classes aren't available to them that they want. And of course, every year you keep them the subsidy and the cost grows. Yeah. Great time. Okay, I'm going to have to, I got to, so one, quick, one, quick one because we got to get going. I absolutely agree with what Dan just said. I'd like to add that as you see, where it takes fewer students, it pushes them to Cal State. As they take fewer students, it pushes them to the community colleges. So they now have a larger number of students trying to get to the And as the community colleges take fewer students, that pushes them to prisons, and that goes back to have a And on that note, why don't we vote? So now if you put up that field in a moment, go here. See what direction we're going to go with USC. Are we going to reduce the uh, fees or increase the fees or leave it the same? Okay, we're going to add $1 billion to the deficit. We are now currently at a $15.1 billion deficit. Tremendous commitment to education amongst the people in this room. And they're going to be, and we're going to go on to health care now. What were the other two, 27 and 47? I, I was just curious. I'm trying to write them down if I ever Yeah, so now I'm going to go back to the, the jock and see what those are. I want to justify my time at your event. Sure. But I'm writing something. These are all very smart. Sorry. Okay. All right, thank you, John. Um, okay, now we're going to go to uh, health care. Should California scale back or expand health care coverage provided through the Medi-Cal program? Number one, no change. And keep in mind that, uh, the, that in March, uh, you know, there, there was a reduction of $2.3 billion in this area. Uh, number two, reduce the deficit of $400 million, further reducing Medi-Cal benefits and eliminating adult day health care. Three, add $2.3 billion to the deficit and reverse the recent changes to Medi-Cal, Healthy Families, and Adult uh, Day Health Care. And four, finally establish a single-payer system, I have to get single-payer in here, uh, of health care in California where a single entity, such as a government-run organization, would collect all health care fees and payments and would pay for all health care costs. But everyone's going to pick that, all right? We're going to find out, John. There's no budget, no budget impact. Yeah, like, yeah, there's no, yeah, we have no budget impact. Uh, on that at this point. It's, uh, <laughs> but this is something, yeah, the other thing I should clarify here, you know, you may ask why are these, how do these policy questions get up here? <coughs> they don't come out of thin air. They have to be something that's being discussed around the state. There has to be something that's going to the legislature. There has to be a governor that's proposing it. Um, we don't pull things out of uh, thin air. I would love to know, though, if you, if, for those of you who vote for, if you don't get number four, what would you do? Like ranked choice voting almost, but I mean, because right. the, 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 the difficulty of single payer, though we're going to see the single payer debate in the Capitol this year in a very interesting way, because the legislature has sent that bill to Schwarzenegger over the years, and he sent it back, and now you got a Democratic governor who's going to get pushed in a very different way, but anyway, I digress. Okay, so we're actually going to be able to do some of this ranked choice voting because 
we're going to see, if a lot of people vote for four, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to uh, not vote. People who voted for four don't vote for four, vote for something else. But you don't have to do that now. Okay, no questions. Great. Let's hit, vote on this right away before anybody raises their hand. <laughs> That's like the speaker when they call vote. We got 1124 here. We're moving along here. We're, we're in good shape, I think. Okay, what do you what do you want to do? <laughs> So now I'm going to ask all of the 61% of you, I'm going to ask you to vote for one, two, and three. So now can you have a re-vote here? Remember, you can't vote for four. You've got to vote for one, two, or three on the re-vote. Okay. Uh, we are not going to make uh, any budgetary decision, so 44% no change. Although there were 30%, 37% of you in the room who wanted to uh, add that 2.3 billion to the deficit and roll that uh, back. So, very good. Let's go on to the next one. Human Services, CalWORKS, and Child Care. Should further reductions be made in CalWORKS and Child Care programs in order to close the budget deficit? Number one, no change. The budget already reflects the $1.8 billion reduction that was done in March. Number two, reduce the deficit by $700 million by reducing grants another 5% and limiting grants for children to 48 months. Three, reduce the deficit by $400 million by further reducing funding for each slot in child care and lowering the income of which families are eligible. Four, reduce the deficit $1.1 billion by further reducing funding for both CalWORKs and child care programs. Uh, it's the addition of two and three, you can see. And five, add 1.8 billion to the deficit and restore the reduction made to CalWORKs and child care programs in March. Question. What would the income floor be on number three? Um, reduce the deficit. I actually don't know the answer to that question. Does any of our panelists know that? Sarah, do you know just, that? Just grab it. Okay. Okay, 
human services. Um, should further reductions be made to IHSS for services for the development, developmentally disabled? Um, no change. And, and again, the budget already reflects a $1.2 billion reduction in March. To reduce the deficit, $500 million domestic services for certain uh, in-home health, what is it, in-home supportive services. services, clients and requiring certification for IHSS services. Three, reduce the deficit $200 million by further reducing services for the developmentally disabled and by implementing purchase of service standards. Four, reduce the deficit $700 million and make both cuts to IHSS and services for the developmentally disabled. Again, you can see that's two and three added together. And five, add $1.2 billion to the deficit and restore the reductions made to these programs. Sir? Um, I'm having a bit of a problem dealing with these questions because they, they are in relationship to what already exists. And if you're talking about performance-based budgeting, we're not seeing that here. I read a very interesting article yesterday uh, in the Stanford Lawyers magazine, which, which proposed cost-benefit analysis for the ju judicial and penal systems to have that be part of the mix of how financial decisions are made. Yeah. Here we have an array of choices, but we have no idea how the performance is or how the cost-benefit analysis comes out between so the you're, you're suffering from the same deficit of information that the people that are actually voting yeah. Yeah. are on this. <laughs> so you're, 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 the, what you're looking for is exactly the information they should have yeah. and that they do not have. It's a perfectly rational quandary that your mind is in. I mean, I can see you adding values to these questions, that it may be desirable to have this as a society. But the values would be hypothetical. Right? Well, yeah. But along with that would be good, this program or this general program saves X amount of bucks or costs X amount of bucks or the cost benefit over the next five years is such and such a figure. And so what we're doing is doing a relative voting system here, which doesn't deal with Okay, that. I think this is a good, you're going to be here at lunchtime. This is a good conversation at lunchtime for us because it's very important. I'm just going to do one more, and sir, you get the last word. We got to keep going here. Okay. If, if we, um, if you say that the, the legislature does not have the information for a cost-benefit analysis, do you think, being a bit cynical, do you think it's because they don't, they don't really want to know uh, that information? Because it's a lot easier to say, gee, we shouldn't cut this or we should have that, rather than to have the information that would force them to do that. Gentlemen's cost benefit analysis. Jim, go ahead. There's a, there's a whole lot of really interesting politics that underlie the resistance to actually have this information, um, and I'd be happy to explore it more at lunch. But but there is there is concern on the part of some that the value of these programs, if made known, would lose public support. Um, there's the support on the other side that that it would make a case for additional spending and therefore additional tax revenue. So you know it's it's a find mischief on both sides. I promise this is 10 seconds. If, you, if, you do, if you're not impacted by these programs and you don't know enough of what they are, let me just give you the, the, the 10 second answer. IHSS, in-home supportive services, uh, largely the money goes toward paying for someone who helps take care of people, provide things that they need to be functional in society. They're often people who are in their family. There's an argument among, among philosophical political spectrums of what these people do without a paycheck, and you will get very passionate answers left and right about this. Developmentally disabled, the single largest part of the increase in that budget is autism. Is children who suffer from autism and the private care they get from private agencies, which is all linked back to the Lanterman Act of the 1960s and what we require. So just to understand where this money goes, uh, because the titles sometimes don't give you enough information if and, you haven't been affected by it. And, and lastly, again, not to advocate, but just to make your jobs more difficult, the argument uh, in favor of option number five and against one through four is that if you reduce funding for in-home support services, many, there's a debate about how many, many of these individuals are therefore going to institutions which costs, which costs even more money. Yes. Okay, last, last comment by Carmen in the back. Carmen, welcome. Um, 
that is one of the big problems. People don't see the cost effective of what would happen with people that are on these services that receive them. I receive them myself. If I don't have the assistant in my home to be able to get on my chair from my bed to be able to be a voice for my community, I'm not a functional person. And we want to be able to keep those services in our community, but what the government is looking at is a number and not a human person. And as myself, which I've had to go to Sacramento several times to testify on budget hearings, they are, when they see when it actually is a person, their vote changes. Because when we're on a sheet of paper, we're just a number. And I would, and I apologize, Noel, but Jim was talking about the political calculations to opposing the technical performance-based budget you were asking about. This woman's case, which is an entirely legitimate one, is a perfect example of the argument against it. If you go to performance-based budgeting, then you are more data-driven and are, are less reliant uh, on the individual story with the human face. But not necessarily the outcomes that she's experiencing, the value of them. It might be less personal, but that doesn't mean the value would be lost. Okay, great. Thank you, Carmen. Let's vote on this. Uh, Let's vote on what you would like to do with regard to human services. Okay, this was close. Uh, almost a 32% vote for to add 1.2 billion to the deficit to rescind those changes, but no, we're going to be a new, no change, so we remain at 15.1 billion. Uh, I'm going to move. I'm going to stop moving things along a little bit quicker. We're at 11:35. We got 25 minutes to do. If you look up on that list right there, you can see we're down to uh, criminal justice. So we haven't even gotten to the revenue. So I'm going to keep things moving. But it doesn't mean you can't try to say something because I'm calling it. Uh, criminal Educate, justice. Medicaid incarcerate. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Should corrections costs be reduced by transferring responsibility for certain inmate, inmates? or by modifying three strikes. Number one, no change. Do not make any changes. Number two, reduce the deficit 1.7 billion and reduce the prison population by transferring certain low-level inmates, parole violators, and juvenile defenders, offenders to counties along with funding. Uh, this assumes, again, this assumes the, the uh, extension of the increase in the vehicle license fee for funding, which we're gonna uh, address later. Uh, number three, reduce the deficit 500 million by transferring inmates to prisons out of state. <laughs> which we already do. Which, which we already do. Right. And number four, reduce the deficit 300 million by modifying the three strikes law to limit new three strikes qualifying convictions to serious or violent felonies. This question clearly is it's got to it's influence some by the Supreme Court decision that we have to reduce the population of California prisons. I should point out that number two, transferring to the counties, not only is that an extent, you know, is, is, is basically the governor's plan of realignment of the state-local relationship, but it does depend in large part on borrowing money, on bonded money to build more facilities. The local facilities do not have, as, as the sheriff in LA and other places will tell you, they do not have the capacity to do this completely all in the short run. So there is another, there is another cost to that, which is you've got to borrow money to build um, jail beds. Okay, I'm going to take one question. Go ahead. Yeah, just a question on the structure. Is why are those mutually exclusive? Yeah. Why, yeah, why I, can't we, I we, yeah. So, so this is what Sarah and I and Marsha we were talking about this the other day in the office, and so uh, we're going to be working on that. Good points. The same communities are affected. So. All right, so we're going to vote. Uh, what are you going to do about criminal justice? Uh, uh, just a little anecdote here as you're voting. Um, when we did some polling, uh, I think maybe, Dan, you know about this, but many, we asked people where does most of the money get spent? Where does it get spent in California? You know, K-12 education, uh, higher ed. Most, I don't know whether it's most, but so many people in California believe that the most amount of money is spent on prisons. Yeah, it's like the, in national polls, people believe that our single greatest expenditure is foreign aid. <laughs> hey, you want to have a read? Okay, I think I tricked everybody. Okay, we're going to do a read. Okay, so now I go back. Everybody was listening to me talk about whatever I was saying. So we're going to do a read vote. Okay, put it up. You guys ready to vote? Vote. Here we go. Uh, not to influence you, but uh, the majority voted for number four. 
from the deficit and we will we're going to go back to the drawing board on this uh, question and uh, see if we could get a number five here and, and add some of this. The reason, the reason that poll number is so interesting all is because no other state allows the voters to have as much say about the budget process as we do and those two things are very interesting. The voters don't understand the budget process but they want to continue to vote on the ballot about the budget process. Yeah. Jim, you want to say something? You know, this issue, by the way, is a good illustration of some of the things we've been talking to about long-term impacts and the long-term performance impacts. Because while people may um, have a misunderstanding about the portion of the budget that's spent on corrections, what is true is that our cost per inmate are among the highest in the country. That's and our cost per inmate are growing faster than in any other state. And our recidivism rate, our for failure of people coming back to successfully reenter our communities, is at 70% among the highest in so this is one of these issues where if over time you want less money to go to prisons and more money to go to UC, you're not going to do it in the next seven days. But you can do it in the next seven years. And by the way, if you decide to significantly reduce prison funding in any of these ways, what you guarantee yourself, matter, uh, Mr. and Madam Legislator, is a very well-funded campaign by the, uh, by the California uh, Prison yeah. Guards Union exactly. against, your, uh, the, against your candidacy. Now, obviously, none of you are going to switch your policy beliefs on the basis of whether or not you can keep your own job or not. That's <laughs> something to keep in mind for a close call. Okay, great points by the panel. Okay, we're going to go to pensions now, something that's uh, very heavily discussed. Uh, should state employee pension benefits be reduced and or employees contribute more towards the cost? Number one, no change. Uh, recent bargaining agreements provide for higher employee contributions and good enough, as you may vote for that. Number two, reduce the deficit to 300 million and negotiate even higher employee contributions towards uh, pension benefits. Three, reduce the deficit to 300 million and negotiate even higher employee contributions and, and reduce benefits for new employees, resulting in significant long-term savings. And finally, number four, reduce the deficit to 300 million and negotiate even higher employee contributions and shift new state employees to hybrid retirement plans resulting in significant long-term savings. Um, this is very important question being... And you will see this on the ballot, I predict. I mean, there are initiatives out there moving to do even more than this, to do right. much more bigger cutbacks to public employees. And Jim, where you used to work, the Hoover Institute, the Hoover Institute can, came up with a plan that suggested a hybrid uh, pension plan. Okay, so I'm only going to take uh, one question, and it's going to be somebody new, and then I'm going to vote. And it's going to be you right there. The, what I don't know about this one is, to me what matters is the total compensation of the employees. And this doesn't say anything about are they well compensated or are they not, and I don't have a clue. Do you know what I mean? The, there, are, there, there are thousands of studies on this that all contradict each other. <laughs> but I think John will correct me if I'm wrong. The general consensus I've seen is that state employees, if you factor in relative levels of education level, receive slightly less pay than their private sector counterparts, but receive more in, in uh, but receive more in benefits. The tremendous challenge is, is that you can uh, you can evaluate a clerical employee, public sector, private sector. You can't you can't how do you measure CHP? How do you measure Cal Fire. I mean, you don't really have those in the private sector the same way. I think in general, uh, there's two different things. There's sal well, there are three things. There's salary, there's pension, and there's health care. Salary uh, maybe is not as debatable. Pension is obviously it's a it's a defined uh, it's a defined contribution uh, defined benefit, excuse me, which is different than the private sector. And health care, which is never really talked about a lot. I mean, we have a very generous health care system. We pay virtually all of the health care of a retiree and their spouse once they retire after being vested after a certain number of years. And that is not, uh, there is no funding uh, plan for that in general in, in, in California. We're paying for retiree health care as we go. That's a huge cost factor in all of it, so. Okay, there's a million questions on this, but we're gonna go, please. Uh, Sonali, we don't have good data, I guess, is the answer to your question, unfortunately, I'm sorry. So, you got three seconds, two seconds, one second. Okay, 300 million from the deficit. 
Congratulations for those of you who voted for uh, items two for through four. In addition to the campaign being funded against you by the CCPOA and the parents, you have now invited the wrath of the CFCA and the California Teachers Association. And the and, and, and the SCIU. Real quick moment, I apologize. Sure. When I mentioned earlier the idea that people wanted to raise taxes on people other than themselves and wanted spending cuts that impacted people other than themselves, in addition to prisons, in addition to welfare, the other item where Californians were overwhelmingly in support of, of spending reductions was in the area of public employee pensions. Why? Because most Californians are not public employees. The only item that got greater support than reduced spending for public employee benefits was the support for a spending cap. But remember, that was among voters who opposed spending cuts in all areas except for prisons and welfare and pensions. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, good clarification. Okay, now we're going to go to the spending cap. Uh, and I spoke about now that you have made specific changes to how programs are funded, would you like to cap overall spending for the next five years? Well, Number one. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Retiree health. Do you have one? Uh, uh, yeah, we're going to. We're not going to do that one. Oh, all right. That's okay. Uh, if, because of time. Um, but it's a good one. Um, <laughs> Uh, no change, do not cap spending. Number two, cap spending for the next five years so that grows no faster than the rate of inflation plus state population growth, about 3% per year. Number three, cap spending for the next five years so that it grows no faster than the rate of personal income growth plus state population growth, about 5 to 6% per year. Number four, cap spending similar to the method outlined in ACA4 and uh, John, you want to tell us what yeah. the CA4 is? Well, I, I can after you go through it. Okay. Yeah. And then number five, cap spending will wait until the state has paid off debts incurred during the recession to impose the cap. <laughs> Another one that I spent time on lately, because I did a piece that actually aired this past week on Monday about spending caps. We have a spending cap in California. You may or may not know that. It's called the GAN limit. It's approved by voters in 1979. Now, it was modified in 1990 with loosened because we found that when we tried to spend money on infrastructure and schools in the late 80s, we had hit the cap, we couldn't spend the money, we had to give all the money back to taxpayers. Sort of, I'm kind of shorthanding history, but such is life. Um, so, but, there's, but the debate over spending caps continues. The questions, I think, you, the, the about spending caps are, if you put this in the state constitution and it doesn't work, what do you do? Um, what is the proper formula? Population, inflation, what grows faster, what grows slower? ACA4, referred to in number four here, is a measure that's supposed to be on the ballot in February that uses a very complicated formula that says any revenues, it's really not a cap, it's a revenue limit, any revenues above the historical average go into a rainy day reserve fund. The problem is the voters rejected that in 2009 when it was linked to taxes, but go figure. So the question is, do you want to try to find some long-term way to deal with unexpected increases in revenue and or the general growth of state spending? I will tell you that I think the, 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 the final analysis, voters continue to want to do this, but how do you plan for what happens 10, 20, 30 years from now, especially if you put it in the Constitution? The, the current negotiations at the Capitol are a temporary spending cap that would go away once the tax extensions go away, which is a demand of Republicans. Okay, so we'll, go ahead, One clarification, you know, I think one of the things that's important for you to always ask is, if you're reading or thinking or talking to anybody about spending caps, is what are you going to do with the money above the cap, right? Because if it's a spending cap that says you've got a volatile revenue system and we're going to take money above a certain level, <coughs> put in a rainy day fund so we don't have to make these tough choices the next time we have a recession, or we're going to pay off the budget-related debt, you know, we're still paying off operational expenses from 2003. <coughs> Right? So if, if you're going to do that with the money, then that's a fiscal tool that's different than wherever the line is, we cut checks back to you. That's a, it's a significantly different kind of spending cap. Which was the original GAN limit, which, which was the original GAN limit. And, and ACA4 is along this other model, which is you capture money above a revenue trend and you use it to pay off debt, fill up the rainy day fund, and put the state back on fiscal service and, and fiscal spend. Okay, and finally, so once again, finally, once again, just to make your jobs even harder, <laughs> uh, a spending cap, of course, is absolute number of dollars, which means that there was growth in the number of students in our elementary schools and the number of recipients of in-home supportive services. In other words, if the population of California grows in any way, shape, or form, it'll mean reductions in the kind of programs we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. Okay, so um, 
This is a big question. It has major multi-billion dollar um, ramifications. Go ahead and vote. Oh, okay. So if you if you vote for uh, number two, the ramifications are a reduction in the uh, deficit of, of 16 points. Point six billion. If you vote for number three, um, it's going to the ramifications of three point four billion. Uh, number four, it's the same as number two, 16, 17 point six billion. And the last one, there's no change. No, just to clarify, that is a one-year budget impact. This is a, this is. The impact in five years. So in other words, if we vote for something with a $16 billion deficit reduction, that will not magically eliminate. No, it's over five years. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. It's one year. It's only one year. So, it, yes, it would, if you voted for two or four, you would move into surplus. I mean, Keep on mind, too, number two is the GAN limit, basically. Right. Number two is the old GAN limit in 1979, <laughs> population state of inflation. And, and number three is the GAN limit as it's been modified. Yeah, the current. Could I ask a clarifying question on that? Of the course, six, of the sixteen billion dollars. I mean, what you're saying is that by imposing the cap, you're enforcing a sixteen billion dollar cut, unspecified in the budget, five years from now. That's right. There's no new revenue. There's no. You're not specifying what expenditures cut. By creating a cap, you're just automatically stopping expenditures, which right. means you have to cut to get to that sixteen billion dollars. But we don't know what the cuts are. It doesn't morning. balance the budget. It doesn't solve the budget. It just says you solve it with this. Uh, would lead to cuts in the programs that we haven't been discussing up until this point in the program. Okay, so we're going to vote. Let's vote, Sonali, on the budget cap. We're going to be very interested to see what you all vote here. Okay, no vote for the cap. So that essentially means that we head into our revenue situation with a four, with a 14.5 billion dollars and I have uh, 1151 and uh, we got a number of taxes to do here so we're going to run right through these and uh, sell the income tax your California raise maintain a lower income taxes number one no change number two reduce the deficit 3.3 billion and reinstate the temporary uh, quarter percent rate increase on all taxpayers um, number three reduce the deficit 3.8 billion and raise Taxes on upper income families, okay, rich people by reinstating the 10 11 percent brackets. Number four, add 3.3 billion to the deficit and cut income taxes by a quarter of a percent. Okay, let's vote. I'm not, not having any questions. So I'm going to be a dictator here. So now I put that up. Just be ready to always be putting it up as we roll through this. And remember, yes votes for any taxes will mean a well-funded campaign by the California Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we got an answer here. Okay, we're going to pass it. Okay, okay so now the next question. Okay, the next question has to do with sales tax. The California change the sales tax rate. Or base number one, no change. Number two, reduce the deficit 5.7 billion. Extend the 1% sales tax rate beyond June 2000, June 2011. Number three, reduce the deficit by 2.9 billion. Expand the base to certain services like architectural services and accounting services and that kind of stuff. Number four, expand the base of services, but reduce the rate by 0.5%, uh, by resulting in no change in revenues. And finally, number five, if you want, how about add 2.2 billion to the deficit and reduce the state tail set, the, the, the rate by half, by 0.5%. Let's vote, so I'll put it up there. Whenever I finish number five, you can even have it up there, I'll raise you up. Okay, sales tax, we're gonna increase the sales tax, lower the sales tax rate. What are we gonna do? I think we have a $10.7, Deficit. Okay, we're going to reduce the deficit by 5.7 billion. 63% of you. That's almost a two thirds. The campaign against you is now being funded by the California Retailers Association, <laughs> <laughs> the Manufacturers Association, and the California Restaurant Association. Okay, thank you. Yeah, corporate tax. Should the corporation tax be maintained? No change. Keep it at 8.84%, which is one of the highest in the country. So in the country, number two, reduce the deficit by 1.1 billion and increase the corporate tax rate to its prior peak of 9.6 billion. Number three, add 1.1 billion to the deficit and reduce the corporate tax rate to 8.1 percent. Let's vote. So now you got it up there. This is a big question. A lot of you know gets in the whole question of business tax uh, of the uh, business environment and how you feel on that. Okay, I know what the answer is going to be here. So we're going to take 1.1 billion from the deficit because we're going to 
increase the amount of somebody did vote. Right. Some people didn't vote. Like it went to 99 percent. Who are you? One percent? <laughs> right. In the California Chamber of Commerce just doubled their campaign against you. The California Manufacturers and Technology Association, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and Technology Network hosts all weighed in as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, tax expenditures. Should California restrict or eliminate certain tax breaks to help balance the budget? Two, reduce the deficit one billion and replace the mortgage interest deduction and tax credit equal to five percent of mortgage interest. Uh, number three, reduce the deficit six hundred million and stop providing tax breaks in enterprise zones. Number four, reduce the deficit one billion and prohibit multi-state corporations from being able to choose which method of assigning income to California that they want. And number five, reduce the deficit two point six billion and make all three changes to now you have it up there. Are you going to vote for one, two, three, four, or five? I bet you I know where you're going to vote. Let me see. Let me see. Am I good? Am I right? Yeah. Yes, I was. Just barely. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. What's our deficit? 1.3 billion. Our deficit is 1.3 billion. Okay. The California Real Estate Builders Association. Vehicle <laughs> license fee. No change. Number two. Reduce the deficit 1.7 billion and extend. The BLF increase of 0.5% for five years. Number three, reduce the deficit to 4.6 billion and reinstate the higher 1997 fee level, which was 2%. And finally, number four, add 2.2 billion to the deficit and eliminate vehicle license fee altogether. A zero rate. Go ahead, Sonali. What do we have here? With our, our, our deficit is only 1.3 billion. Okay, here we go here. Okay, now we are, I think we're in surplus. 1.6 million. Every car dealer and gas station in your district is now handing out flyers against your <laughs> and, and John and Ken, the talk show hosts in LA, are organizing a recall. Somebody got recall over the car tax. Who was that? Uh, <laughs> all, right. all right, property tax, uh, Prop 13, uh, number two. Reduce the deficit to 2.2 million and require annual reassessment of non residential property. This is the split rule. Remember, we're just going to increase the tax for commercial businesses. Number three, reduce the deficit 6.1 billion and require annual reassessment of all property, commercial and residential. Uh, an additional 10.5 billion would go to local government. Number four, reduce the deficit 1.2 billion and allow assessed values of all properties to increase 4% per year instead of 2%. And finally, add 1.5 billion to the deficit and reduce the tax rate for all properties by 10%. Sonali, let's vote. I feel please. the ghost of Howard Jarvis rising. Sorry. Well, well, okay, 2.2 billion. Okay, this is the split rule. So you guys decided that you're, gonna, you're not going to tax residences, you're going to tax uh, commercial properties. Okay, other taxes. Should California raise, collect other taxes to close the deficit? Number one, no change. Number two, reduce the deficit 1.5 billion and impose a 12.5% oil severance tax. Three, reduce the deficit 200 million and impose a sales tax on internet sales where the retailer has a business connection to California. Four, reduce the deficit by 700 million and impose a 5 cent per drink tax on alcohol beverages. And number five, uh, reduce the deficit 2.4 billion and make all three of the changes above. Where are you gonna vote? Let's go ahead and vote tonight. We're almost at the end here. I want to know where you're going to put all this money back if you got the surplus here. <laughs> okay, let me guess here. Let me guess. Let me guess. Yes, number five. Okay, 2.4 billion. Let's take 2.4 billion. We are currently at 7.9 billion. Let's go to, is that it? We go through everything. Oh my God. So, uh, Sarah, what's our results? <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do here, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. I'm really excited that uh, we are in surplus. We, we, uh, but now of, course, now, of course, when you raise these taxes, the Prop 98 school funding guarantee means that automatically some of those dollars go to education. So you could not take all those dollars back and fill in all the projects that you hated to cut because the, 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 the cycle works and the money goes another way. So. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask our panelists. We're going to have a one-minute wrap-up here, okay? And then, we're gonna, then I'm going to choose the raffle winner. 
Um, and then we're going to have lunch. So we're going to start off. We're going to go start from Jim and end with you, John. Jim, go ahead. Well, I want to thank you for your extraordinarily thoughtful questions and comments. Through here. this is obviously a group that's thinking very hard about what the implications to California are for the mess we're in. And, um, and I was particularly impressed with the focus on um, you know, what are we getting here? How do we link up good fiscal decision making, good effective programs to get us where we want to be? If, if you're more interested in that and you want to find a way of continuing that conversation that Noel has uh, teed up here, I'd encourage you to grab some of the material out there from California Forward or go to CAFWD.org and get on the mailing list. This is only going to change. We can only make these kinds of impact if more Californians, one way or another, get involved in conversation. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Jim. Uh, the, 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 the questions, the thought that you put into this exercise is really impressive and very commendable and very, very, very rare. In, in addition to the encouragement that Jim gave you, I would encourage you something else, which is if your schedule should allow, and Noel and Sarah and their colleagues are able to provide it for you, I would encourage you to attend, attend one of these programs in Eastern Contra Costa County, yeah. in the Northern Central Valley, or in Southern Orange County, because what you will see then is the dynamic that the state legislature faces. What we've established beyond any reasonable doubt today is that the people of San Francisco and their elected representatives believe that the budget deficit should be eliminated, not entirely, but predominantly through tax increases. The same exercise, I'm guessing, for in other parts of the state would show the exact opposite. So when every single member of the California State Legislature comes to Sacramento and faithfully represents the wishes of their constituents, what we have is no budget. So I commend you for your interest and your enthusiasm, but it's important to remember as you watch the debate go forward in Sacramento, is there are people across the ideological spectrum who feel just as strongly as you do, and the next step in the process is to take the kind of decisions you made today and figure out what you're willing to compromise away in order to reach a final product that might not get you everything you want, but gets you a good percentage of it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, th thanks for letting me be a part of this. I just wanted to give you a reality check about a couple of things. I mean, I think it was—I think it actually was a good thing. Some of you are probably going to feel distressed that we didn't spend as much time talking about the taxes. The reality is, the polling shows you the taxes are not going to pass in most circumstances. So you are faced with choices of cuts, and I think you, you really went through those a lot. But even if you look at your choices, I was writing up the numbers here. Most of what you have chosen, because Dan makes a good point that I think the legislature is reflective of the disagreement among Californians. Most of your choices would not have passed the threshold for a budget. You need either a simple majority just for cuts or a two-thirds for taxes. The only two things that I know for sure would have passed is you would have raised a couple of taxes and you want universal health care. Everything else, a lot of your choices, even your cuts, did not meet the 50% plus one majority in each chamber of the legislature. And I think that even among a, a group that may not be as um, heterogeneous as other groups would be, still reflects the division, even inside this room, about how you do it and how you get consensus on a majority of people. So, um, but I, again, you, you did a heck of a job. If you were, if the legislature was this fast, I would have a summer vacation. I have not, <laughs> had one in 10 years, and it's not going to happen. So, but thank you. Yeah. All right, now, before I, fi we finally thank uh, our panelists, I want to, uh, Sarah, why don't you pull one out of here? This is for the raffle. Drum roll, please. <laughs> and you have to be here to win. I mean, I'm gonna, somebody in this room is going to win. Do they get a seat in the assembly? What's the... <laughs> <laughs> right, the number? D. Roderick. The first initial D, the last name is Roderick. Okay, let's hear it for time. Now, the tax you pay on that meal. <laughs> Okay, now I'd like to very warmly thank all of you for coming today. You've been a great audience. You are unique Californians. You care deeply about the state, the fact that you came here today. Uh, as I said when I opened up my remarks, I care deeply about California. I know uh, you all do too. Let's keep our fingers crossed that, that this year, uh, over the next few months, some deal gets done that can put the budget beyond us, that can give us a five-year reprieve so that we can focus on these big issues here in California because there are, there are big issues in California, but there are wonderful opportunities too. So on that note, let's also thank our three panelists. Thank you.
you. Again, I'm not sure what kind of food we have here, but it's really good. And uh, so I, I welcome and ask all of you to stay if you'd like to. Thank you once again.